On Monday, October 11th, just before the results were announced of the contract referendum for Western Washington Carpenters, Oakland Socialists had the chance to have a discussion with Pedro Espinosa. Here is the video of that discussion. Since the discussion lasted close to two hours, this video has been edited for time. As we know, there was uh, recently a strike, but prior to that, there were four previous uh, tentative agreements, TAs, that were voted down by the members. And as I'm sure you're aware, it's extremely rare for a contract proposal to, to be voted down. Never mind uh, four, for that to happen four times. And how do you explain the fact that they were voted down? And some people felt like that's an indication that the leadership was really out of touch with the membership. Would you comment on that? Well, you know, being on a committee, and I'm commenting for myself, you know, um, of course, with any organization, you know, the leadership is always there. They're, one, they're the ones that set the pace. We're, we're just there to make sure that uh, we're guided in a direction and we're moving folks in that direction. Um, as far as I see it, what, what was going down was there was a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, you know, and, and all it takes is a few individuals that are not really connected themselves to what is going on. Uh, you can say that when you tell folks that they should, they should get this and they deserve this because then they start comparing with other trades, that, that's when you get into muddy waters, um, especially when the majority of our membership really is not engaged within their own union. They're just there because they're working and they know that this is a job that, that keeps them well fed. It gives them, you know, opportunities to, uh, you know, be able to live in a comfortable uh, manner. Right. So when you have that, it's, it's a cocktail. It's a recipe for, for disaster. You have misinformation. You have members that really don't understand their contract, really don't understand the process of how things are supposed to work and which way they go. And I guess that's, that's what it led up to was just a gigantic amount of misinformation. Um, you know, there, there is, there is a lot to blame on both sides, you know, for us as a union, we should be definitely, we should be more connected. Uh, you know, we try, we, we do our best, uh, but with like anything else, you know, it's up to the member, it's up to the member to take that opportunity to say, you know, you know, I want to be part of this. I want to be a full union member as it states in our constitution, you have to be able to give in order to, you know, grow as a union, because if you don't give, then, then what's it for, right? <laughs> So it seemed to me to be kind of strange that the council and the EST, Evelyn Shapiro, weren't able to counter what you call misinformation. When it comes to social media, we all know how destructive that could be, um, especially when it comes to for us to on. And we've had many, many times where we've gone on that Facebook uh, you know, page and tried to talk to members, but immediately were jumped on you know, by a, a group of people that just heckle heckle and destroy anything that you say they call bs and then they won't let you talk and it's a screaming you know and, and me personally i've gotten kicked out of the, that forum because i would say a few things and then it would kick me out um which is again you want to talk about fairness you want to talk about being able to stand there and say hey listen let's talk, let's have a conversation as adults so let's have a conversation as union members brothers and sisters uh and be cordial with each other but it becomes this slamming a slandering session um, as you can see, there was a lot of folks under that really said some horrible things. You know, I, I get that as adults, we can disagree. And I understand that there's passion on both sides. Uh, one says you're not doing enough. The other says, hey, man, well, we want you to join, but you don't, you're not willing to join. We have to come in the middle, right? But then when it becomes this, there are certain group of folks that took it to the next level where they started you know, calling uh, REST Evelyn Shapiro, uh, you know, uh, misogynistic things. And, and as we know, one of the main leaders of the opposition is a woman who is very highly respected. So I, I don't think that that is really being very fair. But, you know, I've worked in the trade for nearly 30 years. And I have to say that, and that there is a bit of resentment and distrust of the full-time apparatus, partly because of the privileges that they get. And that was expressed. For instance, we know that Evelyn Shapiro makes well over $200,000 as EST alone. And then with other positions, she makes over 300,000. 
and then there is you know um there is like the double pension plans and 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 so on and well again you know it's the will of the body uh the delegates that vote in the est's um wages uh if you want to get down on them then then that's you know that that's where you would ask the question is to go to the delegate body you know a lot of people say well the delegates were you know uh, it's all staff and it's never rank and file but if you look at the numbers com staff compared to uh rank and file rank and file overwhelmingly overwhelm us you know it, it's it's the rank and file that choose those things you know be part of the be part of your local if you feel that there's something different something that is wrong then run for the position do the best you can to change things as you're going in there because you're you're stepping up to the process that it, it should go right we have all these rules and regulations that we need to follow but then when people just start going you know in different directions again remember misinformation can lead a lot of members to doing certain things that they don't fully understand why they're doing it they're just being like hey man i feel this and then it becomes this mess um if the question is that if people think that evelyn makes so much money remember six states 28,000 members traveling all the time. You know, I personally would never take on that, that, that job. We asked about the negotiations behind closed doors and the membership kept in the dark. People have to understand that when, again, remember misinformation can go a long way. If you start saying, well, we're going to move this, we're talking about this. Then people go, Oh my God, that's it. That's all we want. We're going to, and then they start pointing that that's what they want. That's what I, realistically you will never get that. And then they'll start getting that sector of people that wanted that really mad and angry. Why didn't you fight for it? Why didn't you do this? So this is the reason why we ask people to um, chime in. What do they want? We sent text messages. We sent emails in the past. We've done handbills. We've done uh, committee meetings where they'll come in and say, Hey members, what are you guys looking for? Right. Because we want to know what the rule, what the membership re is really looking at. Again, you get a small group of people that come in, okay. And and, I've, and I can tell you this: at one point, we out of uh, twelve thousand members that we had in Western Washington that we have in the under AGC agreement, relatively out of the twelve thousand, about maybe fifteen hundred members will come in and tell us what they want. If you don't have the strength in the market, which means you don't capture everything you have in there, then what happens to us? Well, what do you mean? But but what do you mean by market share? Doesn't that mean that you're selling a product and you know you don't have as much of the market for that product as a competitor? Yeah. That's so who is our competitor? Well, open shop. We well, have a lot of uh, you know, so, a lot of open shop contractors that are underbidding our our contractors. We, we know the game. You know they come in and they underbid us, and then they get the the jobs, and then you know in the end. We need to do a better job of capturing those markets, whether it's uh, TI work, interior systems, concrete work. You know, you could say, hey, hey man, listen, I, we have all the concrete share. Cool. And then that's all you focus on, right? But there's other markets in it that we need to expand. Wood framing. I mean, let's face when it. When you say we capture the markets, what you're really saying is that it's the contractors that have to capture that market, right? What do you mean contractors have captured the market? Well, I mean, what, what, are, what are we, let's put it differently. What are we selling? Well, we're selling a product that we, you know, well, we what's the, the product? People. We have best skilled people, people that are, are on time that will show up. These are professional folks that come there. Uh, they're willing to work. They're willing, they're committed to do what they need to do to make the contractor prosper. So then their jobs are there for our membership all the time. Uh, when you mean contractors capturing that market, the market's already there. So, I mean, the contractors are already there. It's not that they've captured it. It's just that we have to do our job to get more contractors, just like we have to get more members, right? Um, here, here, here's the thing. So how do we go about getting more contractors? Well, okay, and I'm glad you brought that up. What, what was Peter J. McGuire's big, big uh, motivation to get people started, right? It was carpenter to carpenter connection, right? Carpenter to carpenter. It kept going. One brother talks to another brother, it's so on and so forth. You start talking. What we're seeing is that our members are not really organizing because I've heard this, and this is my own uh, personal experiences, is that I've had members, multiple members say, that's not my job. That's your job. You know, in the past, you talk about, let's get to with the non-union guys and all walk out and leave, right? Well, that would love to see that. That that would be a beautiful day for me to see non-union and union carpenters walking side by side to better their lives. 
the restrictions, laws, uh, you know, the, uh, the NLRA has the ability to block us and put, you know, uh, zip ties on us to hold us down. You know, uh, there's been legislation, laws that have been passed to completely smother unions to where they don't have the strength. You, well, you know the history, right? People used to do the walkouts, right? And then all of a sudden you came the lockouts. And so then there's this back and forth, give and take, give and take. What happened, what, what is going on is that there is not a lot of people that really pay attention to the whole scheme of things, right? You talk about being interconnected. We are all interconnected. Problem is, John, is that there's a lot of people that just don't care enough to say there is an issue. What is the problem? If you look at the major problem that we're having is the laws that are built to hinder us. OK, as unions, you know that we have to thin that line because if not, we'll get sued by the contractors. Well, let's let's talk about the laws for a second. Okay. Let's because at the time of Peter J. McGuire, mm -hmm. it was illegal to even talk about a union. Yeah, right. Because it was considered an illegal conspiracy. Mm -hmm. But they overcame that. How? By overtly and openly violating the laws. What built the unions in this country, what really made them a powerful force was the sit down strikes and the mass picket lines in the mid 1970s, 1930s. Mm -hmm. Everything they did was illegal. Mm -hmm. So, but they, and, and because the law, because the law, these anti-union laws were no longer enforceable, then they had to change the law. And so this, this uh, terror of mm -hmm. being sued and of breaking the law and so on, it just goes against everything that was successful in building the labor movement. I totally agree with you. I 100% agree with you on that. But let's look at reality. Say you get a lawsuit. Say you get a letter from an attorney then you then you then you then you build up and what do you, you do right you, you're able you you i mean as a, if i got a letter from a big company saying hey listen pedro you've overstepped your boundaries here's the legal laws that you broke blah 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 you were suing you were taking to court reality is brother i don't have the money to fight that well we're not talking I will be about afraid that because as listen, an, on an individual basis we're but talking but it's not even an individual basis let's just say the whole membership well okay, we're, now, now but, we're fighting now we're dealing with millions of dollars lawsuits millions of dollars to fight and defend yourself even though you you can be right even though you are in the right you're still defending yourself so that means you're you're losing money you know um, back in the 1970s i forget what year it was um when they were first starting to build major projects non-union mm -hmm. in the city of pittsburgh pennsylvania they had a major project that was going to be built non-union so the labor movement the the entire building trades and maybe even beyond that had a big protest for one day in downtown Pittsburgh. It was basically, it was in effect a general strike. They shut down the entire city for the day. And the chief of police said that they did, everything they did was illegal, but what are you gonna do? Arrest 10,000 people and create a riot? The next day that, uh, that job went union. Okay, and you said that that was in the 70s? Right. Okay, so we're in 2021. How many of our members really would do that, go to that extreme? A small amount? Okay, you know what? That small amount, perfect. And then they become the martyrs. They become the people that scapegoats. Oh, they're, they're the ones doing this. And then it becomes this ball, right? What about the rest of the folks that are there that really don't really step in and say, that's not my... The view is to work for the contractor, to provide them a good product. Why? So then the contractor gain more work. And then at that time, open more opportunities for us. So then what, what would your... What would your recommendation be that our members do? Then what is the message that we need to send our members? Then? What is the message that needs to come down from the international? Because there's a notion here that it's, you're saying that uh, a union is just for business only, business only, not the members. What Then what is the message you would like to send out so then our members can receive it in a manner of saying, hey, you know what? The union is fighting for me. What What is that message, John? Because I'm truly lost as to what, right. what else we could say. Right. Well, I think what the union, I mean, in the first place, we have to acknowledge that what the, the official policy of the union, uh, the carpenters union and the building trades in general is not working. Okay. It's not working. It, I mean, every year you see an increase in non-union construction. This happens in good times and bad. So mm -hmm. 
And it, it, when there's full employment, normally you would expect that more work would go union, but that's not happening. Even when there's full employment, when the, when the next recession comes and we know it's gonna come sometime or another, it's gonna get even worse. So, what, and it's also not working in terms of what you yourself said, that the consciousness of the union, the members involvement with the union is at disastrously low levels. So if we start with the, with the established fact that these policies are not working, then we have to look at what did work. And what did work was mass occupations, mass picket lines, um, uh, open, open defiance of, of the court orders and so on. And then we have to figure out, well, how can we get back to those policies? Well, the first thing is we have to openly disavow this idea that the unions and management are collaborators, that they're partners, they're, that they're part of the same team. That's not what unions were built for. And then you, you have to have a commitment from the leadership that we are going to get the get top wages, that the wages are going to keep up with inflation, which they're not. And in fact, that they and also that the union will link up with all different aspects of the struggle of ordinary working class people. And I mean, you had, for instance, there in Seattle, you had that campaign to tax uh, uh, some of the Amazon and so on. To, uh, um, in order to provide services for the homeless. And what happened? The iron workers leadership took the side of Amazon against the homeless. Now the carpenters union, to my knowledge, didn't take a position on it, but they should have. They should have said, look, this is the most oppressed sector of workers. So if you started a campaign like that, I do believe that a huge sector of the membership would turn around and say, you know what? This is a union that's fighting for me. I don't want to have to work 40 hours a week, plus overtime, plus drive anything from two to four hours a day to get to and from work. I want a shorter work week, like what's in our constitution. And yeah, I want to get involved in that. And I also see that to win that, I have to go out and help organize the non-union. And if we have to shut down the entire industry, then so be it. That, that should be the policy of the unions. Uh, you know, throwing peanuts from the gallery is always the best way to do things right. Um, I, I love your approach, but hey, you know, you're right. More people should get together. Boom, I agree with that. More people should come out. Yes, I agree with that. More people should be, you know, willing to put, their, put themselves out there to say, hey, man, I want to fight for something that I believe in. I agree with that 100%. But reality, John, is that doesn't happen, brother. Well, it doesn't I've happen. But it, well, I've talked to a lot of members, John, a lot of members that come in, a lot of members that come in for one thing, and that is what's in it for me. Every, every turn in the discussion, you say, well, the members aren't willing to do this. The members don't care about the union. The members are only thinking about themselves. The members only want to go to work and so on. And it's a bit like a dysfunctional family where the parents, the, the, the people that are running the family, that is to say the parents, blame the kids. But they have to look at themselves and what they're doing. And, and in, in this case, we know from history and from the present situation that in order to make the changes that are necessary, it's never going to start with a thousand people at once. It starts with small groups of dedicated people. Right. And Look at what's happened there in Seattle. You had a small group, relatively small group of very dedicated people who want to see the kinds of changes and what happens. They get threatened with lawsuits. They get red baited. Claims are made that they're violent. Claims are made that they hate women. All this sort of thing. And every you, year, man. every year the non-union increases. And also- but There's different factors. The By the way, you never let me finish on what, what some of those factors are too, okay? Come on, man. Well, whatever. Cash, cash payments are, under the table by okay. non-union guys. I'll, I'll, I'll you, you, you utilizing know. workers, whether whether they're immigrants, whether they're illegal aliens, call them what you want. All these people that are being abused by the system that has continuously takes away from workers. We're all in agreement with that. Okay. The the system is built to destroy 
labor. It is so built to have, destroy labor. So but then we have, have ourselves consuming on each other, telling us that you're wrong and you should be doing this. And then I'm, I'm wrong, or right? It back and forth. Again, remember, if we collectively come together and work our butts off, all of us together, then we can make a change. So but if, if we're having have segments that we can't even agree on what we're fighting for, I mean, it, it really kind of hurts us. I mean, all the way around, John. Well, of course, the contractors are going to resist it. Every well, yeah, I know it. that. Yeah. So if yes. you have a policy, if you have a policy that is not working under these present circumstances, then you have to change your policy. The policy that you're presenting of working in collaboration with the unionized contractors has been a disaster. And sure, it, that, that's like, you, you know, it's like going out in the rain with an with a umbrella full of holes and you get wet and you say, well, the problem is that it's raining. No, the problem is that the umbrella that you have isn't working. So what do we do as a union then tell our contractors that are signatory with us to say, hey, listen, man, you guys had to help us, right? Because that's a partnership, quote unquote. That's what we are. We're partners in this whole game. There's a lot of truths out there that are hidden by lies. And if people want to do that, then that's fine. You do that and you'll see where this thing leads you of misinformation, twisting words to benefit where you're at. Because obviously, I still haven't heard a solution from you. Everything I use to uh, explain where we're at, you've battled and said, no, that's just the way the union guys want you to think. Well, you know what? Honestly, there is no other words to use other than what I've been using. And if you don't like them, that's fine. And a lot of the members here that are probably listening won't like them either. That's, that's okay. I'm not here to battle all our members. I'm here to explain certain things that are going on. And if they don't like those explanations, that's fine. I, again, I, I, you know, I'll try and I'll try. Oh. It, 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 as far as as far as uh, 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 talking about slavery, you know, as I said, there's a long, long history yes. of, of history. workers of workers being called wage slaves, and there's a long history of class society. In the past, you know, after after slave systems were general uh, went out of uh, went out of existence. I'm talking about ancient Rome and Greece and so on. Right. Then they were replaced by feudalism. So you right. had slaves. Then you had then you had the feudal serfs. Then modern capitalism came into existence. Endangered servants. And you right. had and you had the working class. Mm -hmm. But they all had something in common. Yes, there were big differences, say between serfs and slaves, or between the modern working class and and the serfs. Yes, there were big differences, but there was also something that was in, in common between all of them. And what they all had in common was that they had to work for a living for somebody else that owned the means of production and that, uh, that owner of the means of production, no matter who it was, if it was a feudal lord or a capitalist or a slave owner, right. he lived off of the unpaid labor of those workers. Agreed. And so yes, we all do have things in common. Of course, there's huge differences. I'm not, I mean, this is a whole other hour-long discussion yes, it that, is. <laughs> that, that I've been reluctant to get into. It is. But what we need in this country is a mass working class party because you have two political parties of the capitalists and the labor has, doesn't have a party of, of its own. You know, so, on my personal opinion, my, this is my own opinion as an individual, is yes, there, it's only a one party system. There is no Democrat and Republican. It's just one party system because either side flips both ways. Doesn't matter. But you're right. We need people who you know step in. The regular working class. Take Not just to step in, in as individuals. And you no, no, no. I'm saying into... working people getting in line to run for office. No, that no, is, no, no, creates... no, no, no. That's not yeah, what that I'm talking about. Yeah, that creates the. That because creates the pool. I'm not talking about running for office as a Democrat, which is what is. I'm not talking about a Democrat, bro. Again, remember what I said. I'm, I'm talking, talking about, about a working, working class, class a separate, running. A separate political party. That means party. running into a system that needs to be adjusted to fully represent the working class. Let's just say that. Well, okay? we, we're a nonpartisan group. We don't care what party you belong to, as long as you defend the rights of all workers and you believe our goals, you believe our policy, you believe our life. That is what we look at for these politicians. In closing, man, I honestly wish that 
our unions would would our union would come together. We can have differences. We can have our opinions. Uh, we can certainly have our disagreements. But when we take it out and start airing out our all disagreements to the entire world, where it doesn't benefit us because it makes us look like we're so dysfunctional and destructive inside, then what message are we sending to the rest of the people? Um, me personally, again, I've said that I, it doesn't matter if people um, stand on different sides. If it comes to a union issue, hey, more than happy to help you out. I will always be there to fight for my brothers and sisters out there. And I, I believe in what the union has brought for me and my family. And I will continue to do that. Uh, but I also don't feel that it's just that we throw stones and bash our leadership where people think it should be this, it should be that. You know, honestly, it's easier said than done. Uh, I would state that I would never, ever like to be in those positions because they're hard. And sometimes you'll, when you make a decision, people don't like it. And then you'll have these situations where, people will be casting them. So again, I would state, I wish and be hopeful that we can come together as a union, become stronger from these points to learn from each other, because that's all we got. We got each other. And we the only thing we got to do is learn and keep learning. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to thank you, Pedro, for coming online and, and discussing with me. And I, I'm assuming that you knew before before you agreed to this discussion that we had some big differences yes um and differences within the working class movement are inevitable and it's actually a positive and a healthy thing and there's no way because we're not a tiny little uh, group of people or relatively tiny like the capitalists are there's no way that we as workers can uh, discuss these differences in an open and democratic way that we can do it behind closed doors. And in fact, it's entirely healthy to have these uh, uh, dis uh, discussions out in the open. Um, as far as personal attacks and bashing people, I have to say, and I'm not talking about you here, Pedro, but I have to say that most of the personal attacks and most of the bashing of people have been one way the red baiting, the claims that the uh, Maguire group and so on are misogynists and hate women, which is completely false. Um, the claims that they've threatened violence, all these things. So most of those attacks, the personal attacks have not come from those who uh, oppose the position of the, of the council and the union leadership. Um, and the terminology that we use is not accidental. The fact, the, the fact that the union leadership talks about market share, the fact that it talks about that we're uh, collaborating or that we're partners or, uh, with the employers or we're on the same team with the employers, they can stop using, using those terms. But the reason that they stopped using those terms is that it's too revealing of what they're actually all about. And what they're actually all about is to be on the same, to uh, try to be on the same team with the unionized contractors in order to entice the non-union contractors to sign a union contract because that will uh, uh, help uh, boost their profits. And behind that is the idea that as far as market share, that our real competition is the non-union carpenters. And that uh, uh, rather than joining with the non-union carpenters to raise the wages, to, ha to engage in an open pitched battle with the contractors, union and non-union alike, that's a book that's sealed with a thousand seals to our entire union leadership. And what has been said about, uh, uh, about the consciousness of the carpenters as I say, I've seen it ever since I joined the union in 1970, that everything has been done to make carp to encourage carpenters to think of themselves as individuals rather than as part of a collective and to discourage those who would uh, uh, 
po- who tried to maintain the traditions of the of the labor movement when it was most powerful and successful. And to the extent that people that individualism does exist as a mass uh, form of thinking amongst uh, not just carpenters but amongst union members and all and all workers that the union leadership has to take some of the blame for themselves and that will not change will not be easy but it will and most times it will start with a small minority and yes they will be repressed and face all kinds of consequences but you know that's the history of our class.